Good morning. Welcome to this virtual worship service. Whether you call Resurrection Oakland your home or whether you are new, we are glad that you're joining us this morning. Today is the day. Today is the day that changed history. Today is the day that changed lives. Today is the day that put guilt to death. Today is the day that put shame to death. Today is a day that Christ put death to death. Today is Easter. Today is the day that we gather with the church universal, with the church historic, with the church triumphant, and we celebrate our great hope in the Christian story that Christ conquered the grave. He conquered and he covered the chasm that existed between us, one another, and between us and God and church, that is great news. What that means for us is that no matter what we've done, no matter what we encounter, no matter how far we fall, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So let me invite you to stand this morning as God calls us to worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Jesus trampled death itself by his own death on the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in resurrection glory, he's bestowing life to those who are dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Let me invite you to remain standing as we sing of this great news together.
alone our hope is found this is the story that we get to sing this morning and we're going to declare that and confess that together from the Apostles Creed you can find this and pray this and read this along with me in your worship guide Christian what do you believe I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue to confess our faith together. Amen, 
I'm alive, I'm alive because He lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never ends because He lives. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Resurrection Oakland. We come now to our time of community life. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. Whether you're convinced or you're unconvinced or you're somewhere else on the spiritual spectrum, you are welcome here. We are a church, we're a community that uh, is seeking to love our neighbors and our cities just as Jesus has loved us. So if you are new, we want to encourage you to get connected. One of the ways that you can connect uh, is through signing up for our weekly email. You can find that uh, sign up on our weekly ministries page on our website. There's no spam. We'll just send you a weekly email that keeps you up to date on what's going on in the life of our church. Also, if you are in need, we really want to know. If you need prayer, if you would like to join a virtual community group, if you need practical help, if you need financial assistance, whatever it may be, there is a care form on our website on that weekly ministries page Please fill that out and let us know how we can best care for you in this season. Lastly, next week we will have a virtual Q&A following our broadcast uh, on a Zoom call with Pastor Brent and others. Uh, this is especially for you if you are new to Christianity or if you have questions about Jesus or about the Bible. We're a church that doesn't pretend that we have all the answers, but we are a church that puts a premium on creating the space to ask hard questions, and to have the hard conversation. So let me invite you to join us next week. You can find the link for that Zoom call on our Sunday broadcast page. If you just go to the bottom of that page, you'll see the link there. Would love for you to join us. Um, all the details on these announcements you can find on that weekly ministries page on our website. You can also see more announcements on the worship guides uh, in front of you. As always, if you are watching 
with us on Facebook or on YouTube. We want to know that you're watching, so please leave us a comment. If you are new, uh, leave us a comment as well. Let us know how you found us. If you're on Instagram and you're posting pictures or stories, please tag us and follow us at Res Oakland. We would love to see you worshiping at home or wherever you may be. Finally, as we've done uh, in the past several weeks, um, during this moment, we usually greet one another, but because we can't, because we're not in person, let me encourage you to pull out your phone, your computer, whatever it may be, send someone a text or an email, let them know that you love them, you're thinking about them, uh, and then you care about them and you're praying for them. While you do that, we're going to play a little video for you of folks in our congregation that are showing you their love and greeting you this Easter Sunday. Let's greet one another right now. Christ, Christ is risen. 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 Christ has risen. Hallelujah. Christ has risen. Christ is 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 risen. Hallelujah! We are excited to get back to church because we can't wait to worship God with our friends. We're excited to be back together again. In person, face to face. Very, very soon. I'm excited to get back to church so that I can sing all those wonderful worship songs. We are excited to come back to church for... Bible stories. For songs. For seeing all the children. For hugs. For sermons, the music, and the pastries. I'm excited to be back in church to be with the entire congregation. I'm excited to come back to church and um, do the nights of prayer with everyone. I can't wait to get back to church because I miss everybody and I miss pastor's sermons. We're excited to get back to church to see everybody again. We're excited to come back to church because childcare. I'm excited to come back to church because I've missed serving the Rest Kids ministry. And I miss everyone. We can't wait to get back to church because nothing compares to being in the presence of God and His community. And we draw strength from that. I'm excited to come back to church because I miss joining my voice with the rest of the congregation during worship. And we can't wait to get back to you at Resurrection Church. I'm excited to go back to church to learn about Jesus and to eat and to eat um, the pastries. The pastries. We love you, Res Oakland. Happy Easter. We love you. I invite you all back to sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Please stand as you are able to and sing some praise with us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly standing as you're able during our scripture lesson today. A reading from Luke 24. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and all our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, 
and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. But he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Let's take just a moment to pray together. Father, we come from so many different places uh, and backgrounds this morning. Some of us come convinced of the things that we have been singing and praying. Others of us come unconvinced. Some of us come just trying to figure out what we believe. We come from places of joy and places of sorrow. Uh, We come from places of sickness and places of health. We come from places of plenty, and others of us are just wondering how we're going to make it through this month. We come from places of feeling known and connected, and we come from places of feeling isolated and alone. So many different places, and yet in one sense, we come from the same place. We are more broken than we know. We're more of a mess than we know. We are more in need of your grace than we know. And we thank you this morning that you see us in all of that need. And your response is not to move away from us, but to move towards us in love. Would you do that even now through your word, by your spirit, and for the glory of your son? It's in his name we pray. Amen. You can take your seats. Um, James Stewart was a, he was a New Testament professor who taught at the University of Edinburgh. And he asked this question. He says, what is the most characteristic word in the Christian religion? Suppose you were asked to single out one word to carry and convey the cardinal truth of the gospel What word would you choose? Now, how would you answer that question? What word would you choose? Some of us would choose words like faith or morality or worship. Some of us would choose words that are more negative, judgmental, narrow, oppressive. Some of us would choose words that are more positive, Grace, love, forgiveness. Stuart says that when you read the New Testament and the teachings of the earliest followers of Jesus, that the most characteristic word used to describe Christianity is the word resurrection. He says that is what Christianity essentially is. It is a religion of resurrection. And that definition has not changed for over two millennia. The resurrection was and it remains the central cog in the Christian faith. And this is why Christians have gathered together every Easter Sunday for over 2,000 years to say Christ is risen. The resurrection is central 
I mean, it is so central that if you lose the resurrection, you actually lose Christianity. Now, why is that? Why is the resurrection so central? Well, it's central because it tells us three things about Christianity. We actually see all of them here in this text this morning. It tells us that Christianity is a rational truth for your mind. It's a transforming power for your life. And it's a burning satisfaction for your heart. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And so first, let's, let's just dive in here. That Christianity is a rational truth for your mind. Now in Luke chapter 24, the passage that we read this morning, we find this rather famous story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And verse 13 tells us that they are coming from Jerusalem, which means that they were in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified. And now they're on their way home when they encounter the resurrected Christ. Now, if you're skeptical of Christianity, I want to just talk to you for just a moment because one of the things that I hear people often say, um, skeptics say, is, you know, I can embrace many of the teachings of Jesus, like caring for the poor, uh, like um, turning the other cheek, like treating others how you want to be treated. I can embrace the teachings, but what I can't embrace are the claims, and specifically the claim of the resurrection. You know, I could never believe this actually happened, that it's actually true. To believe that Jesus rose from the dead, it's just too big of a leap of faith. It is a fairy tale. It's just made up. It's not reasonable. It's not logical. It's not rational. But here's what I want you to see this morning. Everybody in this passage is being rational. Everyone. And let me just show you. First, Luke, the writer, is being rational. You know, Luke goes to great lengths to show us that that's actually the case. There's so many details in the way that he writes and in what he writes that tell us, you know, Luke is not just giving us something here that's fairy tale or just kind of make believe. Now, in verse 18, he tells us that the name of one of the disciples is Cleopas. Now, do you know what this is called? What Luke is doing here is he's giving us a footnote. He's saying, oh, you don't believe me? Well, go talk to him. Go talk to Cleopas. He, he saw it. He was an eyewitness to it. And all of the Gospels do this. In all of the Gospel accounts of the resurrection, the Gospel writers are constantly dropping names. Why are they doing this? It's so that their original readers could go straight to their sources. It was a way to check the facts, to check the evidence. But that's not the only way that Luke is being rational in this passage. Here's another way. In verse 22, the two disciples start talking about the first eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. Who were they? They were women. And that little detail is actually included in all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was the women who were the first at the tomb. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, in the first century, women were of such low social status that their testimony was not admissible in court. See, if, if you're making up a story, you never would have put women at the tomb first. The only thing it would have done, would, 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 it, would be, it would undermine the believability of what you're saying. And so therefore, the, the only possible motivation of actually putting women at the tomb first is because... They were at the tomb first. It's what happened. Now here's one last example of how Luke is being rational. He doesn't sugarcoat the failure of these disciples. You know, Jesus is right in front of them and they don't recognize him. And Jesus actually says to them how foolish you are and how slow to believe. I mean, if you were just, if you're Luke... And you're just inventing, inventing a story to try and get kind of some new religion off the ground. Wouldn't you want to portray Jesus' followers in, in a little bit of a better light? I mean, wouldn't you think, okay, this is kind of my chance to create some really good marketing material and make these people look strong and bold and like they are full of faith and full of virtue. Why would you highlight their unbelief and their failure Answer, because that's what happened. That's what happened. See, Luke is like a reporter. He's just giving us the facts. He's just telling us what happened. No fluff, 
no fairy tale. He is being so rational. But he's not the only one who's being rational. You know who else is being rational in this passage? The two disciples. Why don't they recognize Jesus? You know, I mean, this is, it's kind of a comical moment in the Gospels. They, they were with Jesus for, for several years. And here he is right in front of them. And they don't recognize him. Why don't they recognize him? Well, it's very simple. It's because they think he's dead. Well, why do they think he's dead? It's because they're thinking. They're just being rational. Dead people don't become undead. They were as logical about that in the first century as we are today. And you know, Jesus had told them countless times, I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to rise again. And yet here in verse 19, especially, you've got them talking to Jesus about Jesus as though he were in the past tense. Do you see this? He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. They think he's dead. They're just being rational. But that's not the only way they're being rational in this passage. Because in verse 17, it says that their faces were downcast. They were in despair. Why are they in despair? Because they're looking at life without a resurrection. See, when Jesus died, their hope died. Their their hope that death was not the end. They're looking at Jesus' death and they're saying, well, if death was the end for him, death is the end for us. If he's not going to rise, then we're not going to rise. Now, I know it is Easter, and I know we like to just think happy thoughts on holidays. But if you are skeptical of the claims of Christianity, I'm going to push you here for just a moment. Because anyone who thinks rationally about life without a resurrection will be in despair. You know, if you say this world is all there is, there is no God. We, we came from nothing, and when we die, we go to nothing. How can, it, how can it make any logical sense to say that life has any meaning? If your origin has no significance and your death, your eternity has no significance, how can you say the time in between has any significance? Do, do you know what that's called? It's called a leap of faith, actually. I was reading an article a couple months ago um, by George Yancey. And George Yancey is a philosopher at Emory University. And uh, he recently wrote an article in the New York Times called Facing the Fact of My Own Death. And he, he, he wrote this. He said, the fact of death is like a haunting. It frequents me, entangled in everything I do. It's just beneath my pillow as I sleep, strolling next to me as I casually walk from one class to the next, inserting its presence between each heartbeat in my chest, forcing its way into my consciousness when I say I love you to my children each night assuring me that it can unravel the many promises that I continue to make and threatening the appointments that I need to keep. This sense of haunting is what Harvard professor Cornell West calls the death shudder. And of this shudder, West writes, where does non-existence take you? What does it mean to be stripped of your own consciousness? How do we live with the idea that we are always tantalizingly close to death and that, in, and that at any moment the bridge can collapse? Yancey says, I make a resolute effort to remind my students that all of us at some point sooner or later will become rotting corpses. And that, I explain, is the great equalizer. No matter how smart, brilliant, wealthy, beautiful and fit you are, no matter how great your MCAT, your LSAT, or your GPA scores, no matter your religious or political orientation, we will all perish. And after hearing this, my students will often become completely silent. 
there is a sudden recognition that something has been haunting our joy, our unquestioned and collective happiness, our sense of permanence. It is palpable. No matter how many times I've decided to remove the veil, the sting of our collective finitude continues to hit me along with the reality of bodily decomposition and decay. The unspoken reality of death, which is the haunting background of our lives, shakes my body. Yancey says, I mourn for me and my students and humanity. And I am not sure if the death shudder will ever abate while I'm alive, I don't seem to be able to achieve the necessary adjustment and the solace of acceptance. Now you say, that's, that's really depressing. Yeah, but it's also really honest and consistent and rational. See, without a resurrection, there is no way, there is no way to go through life with a rational hope. But with a resurrection, and not one that is just a fairy tale, but one that is true and rooted in history and something that happened in the first century, not only is there a rational hope, but there is infinite hope. Death is not the end. This is why Paul says, O oh, death, where is your sting? And not only is death not the end, but your life actually matters. Every second counts. The in between has significance. Now, there's a second thing that the resurrection teaches us about Christianity. It's not just a rational truth for our minds, but it is a transforming power for your life. Here's what we know about these early disciples of Jesus in Luke chapter 24 and all of his other early disciples is that their lives were radically changed overnight. Before Jesus died, they were constantly letting him down. They're constantly looking out for themselves and for their own interests. There's a scene in Mark's gospel where James and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, come to him and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, well, one of us would like to sit at your right and the other would like to sit at your left in glory. It's kind of like saying, Jesus, we want to go straight to the top. Take us straight to the top. I mean, here Jesus is seeking to serve others, and here they are seeking to serve themselves. They're constantly misunderstanding the nature of his kingdom. They're constantly breaking their promises to be faithful to him. They were constantly doubting. They were prone to bouts of anger and violence. I mean, let's not forget that Peter cut somebody's ear off the night before Jesus died. They were cowards at the cross. They went into hiding. In Jesus' greatest moment of need, they abandoned him and they betrayed him and they denied him. Yet before his death, they could not have been more of a mess. But after his death, they could not have been more changed. Here's what we know from history that this became a community of people who were so generous with their money and their possessions that they took care not only of their own poor, but of others' poor. They were so loving that in the pandemics, they took care not only of their own sick, but of others' sick. They were so merciful towards their enemies that even those who opposed them began to join their movement. And they were so courageous that they proclaimed the gospel even at the expense of their own life. Now, what created that kind of change? What happened? Do you know what they would say? We saw him. The resurrection happened. The resurrection brought this power into their lives. And it radically changed them. Uh, N.T. Wright, he, he says, imagine someone gives you the most beautiful painting that you've ever seen. That it's a painting of a measurable worth and a measurable beauty, and it's painted on this enormous canvas. And you, you take it home, and you're trying to find a wall in your house to put this painting on, but then you begin to realize there actually is no wall in your house. 
that can fit a painting of this size and this grandeur. So at that point, you have two options. See, are you going to rebuild your entire home around this painting? Or are you going to walk away from this painting because it doesn't fit neatly into your home? And what N.T. Wright says is that that is the dilemma the resurrection presents to us. If it is true, it doesn't fit neatly into your life. You know, Christianity never claims to be a religion of convenience. (laughs) It doesn't fit neatly into your life. It actually requires you to rebuild your entire life around it. But when you do, you'll begin to discover that the life you build around this beautiful painting is the life you have always wanted. Your life begins to take on the loveliness of the main subject of this painting. What's the main subject? It's the risen Jesus. Now, what was Jesus' life like? It was a life of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness. See, that's what the resurrection brings into your life. That kind of change. And it's not just because you're simply trying harder. No, it's because a transforming power has come into your life and it's now changing everything about you. See, Christian friends, where do you need to see this resurrection power in your life this Easter? Where are you anxious and afraid? Where is bitterness and resentment enslaving you? Where do you feel trapped in your past? Where do you feel hopeless? You are never hopeless when you are a Christian. Jesus rose from the dead. There is nothing in your life that is too big or too hard for God to change. Christianity is a transforming power for your life. It's a rational truth for your mind. Here's the last thing the resurrection teaches us. Christianity is a burning satisfaction for your heart. Now, I've been gripped all week by verse 32. Actually, this is why I picked this passage uh, to preach this Easter Sunday, just because of this one, one phrase, that after Jesus eats with the disciples, they don't recognize him, they don't know who he is, and then he leaves them, And they look at one another and they say this. They say, we're not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us. There's this burning. There is something about Jesus that made them say, this is what our hearts yearn for. There was something about Jesus that made them think our deepest hopes and our deepest longings are met in that man. I was listening to a podcast this week with Fleming Rutledge. She's an Episcopal priest and just an incredible Christian author. And she was talking about Sigmund Freud's view of religion. Now, Freud's view of religion was that all religion is wish fulfillment. And so the general idea here is that humans are, we're full of wishes and we are full of needs And we have this insatiable desire to conjure up some way of getting those wishes and those needs filled. And what Freud said is that religion was the quintessential way of doing this. That we have these longings, that we want to be satisfied, so we imagine some sort of divine figure who can satisfy them. In other words, religion is just wish fulfillment. We invent God. We create God. Now that might sound convincing for some of you, but here I think is the big gap in Freud's critique of religion. And the big gap is this question. Why is it that we are creatures of longing and wishes? Will you think with me for just a moment about your deepest desires? I mean, why do we long for love relationships? Why do we yearn for justice? Why do we hunger for meaning in life? 
Why do we desire to not die and live forever? Why do we seek beauty? Why do we want a world that doesn't have viruses? I mean, think about your desires, your deepest desires, love, justice, beauty, meaning, a hope beyond death. Where do those desires come from? See, are they just random products of evolution? Or are they clues to something else? C.S. Lewis says that if we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, it must mean that we were made for another world. It means that the best moments you experience in this world were never meant to satisfy those desires, but as Lewis says, to only arouse them in order to suggest the real thing. And I love the way that he captures this whole idea in his novel, Till We Have Faces. It's, it, he's uh, recounting a conversation between two sisters, Uriel and Psyche. And there's a scene where Psyche says, Uh, to her sister, I have always, at least ever since I can remember, had a kind of longing for death. And Uriel asks, Psyche, have I made you so little happy as that? And Psyche says, no, 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 you don't understand. It's not that kind of longing. It was when I was happiest that I longed most It was on happy days when we were up there on the hills with the wind and the sunshine. Do you remember the color and the smell and looking across at the gray mountain in the distance? And because it was so beautiful, it set me to longing, always longing. Somewhere else there must be more of it. And it was on those days where everything seemed to be saying, come. It's not just when life is hard that we long for something more. It's actually when life is going exceptionally well. It's when we taste, we get a taste of our longings, that we actually get a sense of a deeper longing. That that even our best moments point to something beyond themselves. And what I want to suggest to you this morning and what the Christian story suggests to you is that that something is a someone. That all of these other longings, all of these other wishes, all of your desires, they are clues. And they are meant to lead us back to God, not to a God that we have invented or a God that we have created, but to a God who has created us. And that is why our hearts burn for him. That is why they yearn and long for him, because we were made for him. And here is the incredible news of Easter is that God has not simply left us clues to find our way back to him. He has come to us. He stepped into this world and onto a cross and into a tomb. And three days later, he walked out of a grave. And the world has never been the same since. And he did it for you. And he did it for me so that we could have a rational hope, so that we could be changed, and so that we could be filled and satisfied in him. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the great hope that we have in the resurrection. I mean, it really does change everything. Would you give us grace today that we might be filled with joy and hope and your risen son so that we might be the people that you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of Christ who has risen and who will come again. Amen.
Typically, at this point in our service, we receive an offering. And so if you give electronically or via check, we want to encourage you now to include that as a part of your worship. Giving is, is a part of our response to God. He has been so generous to us. He has withheld nothing from us, even his own son. And so our giving is actually a chance to simply respond to him and to partner with him in what he is doing in this church and in this city and in our world. And we've been saying this each week, that these gifts are going to be so critical as we seek to meet the needs of those in our city and those in our church in the weeks and months to come. If you're just tuning in this morning for the first time online, you've just discovered us, we are so glad that you've tuned in. We don't want you to feel any expectation whatsoever, uh, whatsoever to give. Use this time now to respond to God with your gifts and to the things that you've heard this morning. you to sing by his stripes. By his stripes we are healed. By his nail pierced hands we're free. By his blood we wash clean. Now we have the victory. Sing the power of sin. The power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame it all. Yes, he did. He has won our freedom. Jesus has won it all, it all. So we sing this, hallelujah, you have won the victory, lift up your voice and sing, hallelujah. Have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen King, yes, and just seated in majesty. You are the risen.
He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high. Can you sing that with me? Our God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please join us now as we pray for the needs of our city and of our world. Our Father in heaven, you are our creator and sustainer. In a world that to us appears unsettled, you remind us of the reality that you are sovereign over the world and over our lives. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic and for those who are sick. May they know that you are walking with them through this most difficult time. We ask for your healing touch on all who are sick. Father, we pray for those in our city who are the most vulnerable, whether it be because of age and health condition or because they lack shelter and stability. We pray that in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. Father, we pray that this church will be a part of how you draw near to the broken. Heavenly Father, we lift up those who are alone and hurting and feeling scared. Father, you know our history, you know our recent and our past. You love us, you care for us, and you promise to be with us in this time. Thank you that with you, we truly are never alone. Father, we pray for City Team, Harbor House, and other Christian ministries in the city that are seeking to serve you and show your love to those in need during this time. We ask that you would bless them so that they might be a blessing to others. Thank you for the work that they're doing. Please empower them by your Holy Spirit to continue in it. Father, we pray for Resurrection Oakland and your church around the world, that we may be faithful witnesses in our communities. Help us to be good stewards of your grace, using the gifts you have given us to speak your truth and to serve our neighbors, that in everything you may be glorified. Father, we pray for all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us from our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name. Name of Jesus. 
Please join me now in our sending prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, by your only son's death on a cross, you redeemed and restored us to yourself. And by his glorious resurrection, you saved us from the powers of our enemies, sin and death. Let your spirit be with us and help us to die daily to sin so that we might also rise and live forever with him in the joy of his resurrection life. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive God's blessing on your life. We call this a benediction. It simply means the last word. God always gets the last word. And more than any other day of the year are we reminded on Easter Sunday that that word is always a good word. So receive God's blessing on your life. May the joy of the resurrection and may the hope of Easter fill your hearts and minds. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.